I'm Stephen John Drew from Better Podcasting, a podcast about podcasting, part of the Gunna Geek Network. Just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find fantastic geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. And welcome to Play Comics, where once again, we are here talking to a creator about the cool thing that they're making. This time, I'm here with Corey Bird taking a look at a special edition of his comic, Tooth and Nail. Corey, how are you today? I'm good, and thanks for having me here. I'm so excited to get to talk to you about this one, because I've been grabbing Tooth and Nail as it's been coming out, but now... For anybody who's missed it or for anybody like me who just likes it and wants to have only one book to bring into the bathroom with them instead of five smaller books, <laughs> we can get that. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a, it's a big project for me, um, you know, because I'm going back and I'm cleaning up and fixing things and remastering things to kind of keep it consistent all the way out because I didn't have the tools in the beginning uh, when I first started doing Tooth and Nail uh, that I have now. Uh, such as Procreate, um, I'm able to like clean up things and add effects, new brushes and stuff that I was able to get on there. So going back now, I get to see a lot of the mistakes that I made, and I'm able able to go back and clean stuff up and add stuff in. So it's, it's really exciting. It's a lot of work, but you know, I, I look forward to getting it out there. For anybody who doesn't know, what is your elevator pitch for Tooth and Nail? Well, Tooth and Nail is an action adventure story uh, regarding four cats or Neko who are protecting their village from the rat rattle, which are much rat, uh, who are trying to take over and, uh, you know, kind of destroy them and take over everything. But um, there's more things underneath that's going on that you find out about um, as you continue to read. And you find out there is a rogue Neko that is actually teaming up with the rat to try to take down the Neko. And um, the four Neko uh, warriors that are being trained now, um, who actually in this art complete their training and everything, but certain things come about that um, force uh, them to kind of up their game and prepare for a big battle that's coming. Anybody who has even half a second of anime or manga exposure in front of them can tell that this is very heavily manga and anime inspired. But what specific pieces was it that were inspiration behind the looks and the story of Tooth and Nail? Um, I'm a big Ninja Turtles fan, so that's one of the first things that um, I really pull from. They don't really, I mean, they're four cats. They have distinct personalities and everything. They're, they um, aren't like teenagers and goofy or anything like that. I mean, some things can be goofy here and there, but it's more of a you know, straightforward story and more of a uh, ongoing series. So, like, if you like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, if you like Naruto, I, I pulled a lot from Naruto because I'm a big Naruto fan, um, and Rurouni Kenshin, um, because those are very, like, Japanese-oriented and have a lot of, you know, the heavy action and, um, you know, tongue-in-cheek humor and stuff like that that I kind of pull from from those series. One thing that really excites me about this is kind of what you've touched on before, going back and being able to clean things up. Uh, so how long have you been working on Tooth & Nail? Tooth & Nail has been, I've been working on it for about three years now. Um, and it's been, it, it's been great. I mean, I've been going to conventions. I've been doing other side projects through Bird's Eye View. Um, and then I also did a um, side story of one of the characters, actually the rogue netcode that I mentioned name Oni, which is sort of a prequel story. So I've been doing a lot of things in between the two nail stuff. And Bird's Eye View is your own publishing imprint name, right? Yeah. Yep, there is. I can't imagine where Corey Bird would get a name like Bird's Eye View. (laughs) 
the the funny part is it actually kind of comes from my late father. He uh, started like a, um, a t shirt uh, company a little while. He didn't really get off the ground, but he used the words "bird's eye view," and so it's kind of a homage to him uh, for you know what he had done in my life and art and everything. And of course, it kind of just works into the motif of uh, comic book you know, drawings, stuff like that, because of the, the style of, you know, the technique of bird's eye drawing. And, you know, my, my last name is spelled B-Y-R-D, but it's you know, pronounced B-I-R-D. So it's, it's a name that has always been, you know, kind of <laughs> a joke here and there and everything. And I've kind of used it so many way, different ways. So I figured, hey, why not make it bird's eye view? At, at first, I wanted to make it blackbird but i was like nah go with the bird's eye view i think that sounds a little bit more appropriate i can't remember which issue it is now but i know i remember seeing like thanks to your dad in one of them as i was looking through stuff again today at lunch yeah the first one was uh the dedication that i gave to my dad unfortunately he did not get to see uh tooth and nail get off the ground uh he actually the first i believe the next year after he passed is when i'm uh First published the first issue. I believe so. <laughs> I, might, I, might be, I might be get my time off the road wrong, but he didn't get the chance. I know that. Time doesn't mean anything, especially over the past few years. Yeah, I know. I know. Especially after COVID and everything. But what, what year it is anymore. <laughs> so normally I'm kind of most interested in which character you've made yourself kind of follow in here but are there any characters in this one that are following your dad and being him no really i didn't take too much from actual people in my life actually the four cats are actually taken from real life cats. uh when i first met my wife uh she her mother had four cats and they're actually named after uh you know the cats that's in the story is actually named after those four cats i actually changed onyx's name from buddy onyx because that just would have sounded goofy compared to Jade, Sapphire, and Destiny. But they all four cats named after them. And then the other cats in the story, there's the big cat named Max was a cat that we used to have. Um, uh, Dandy was actually Dandelion, a cat that we had as well. And then um, as the story progresses, you'll see other cats pop up and everything because we're always getting new cats in our, in our home and everything. And Oni is actually based on my friend's cat, um, they had two cats as well, and one of them is only. They still have all actually, actually. And when I saw his like this way he, he looks, he's like real puffy and furry and orange. That's what made me want to put only into the story because uh, the more cats I get, you know, in real life, the more I can actually put in the story. But there's other cats that will come along that I actually have now um, that I plan to put into. So I didn't really pull from real human beings. It was more pulling from actual cats in my life. As you've written this, kind of with those cats in mind, like, do you think this is how they would actually be acting if it was them in this situation? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, cats are sometimes unpredictable. You know, they they change after the years and and everything. So, um, I, I think I kind of I kind of went off the tropes of different characters, either anime tropes or you know just character tropes in general, where you had the the, the leader cat, you had a you know. Uh, Sometimes a goofier character, um, a real serious character, a character that's kind of like in the middle of being serious, but uh, can have a little fun. So when it came to personalities, I think I was just kind of like going through the tropes of different characters that I have you know, studied through the years so with uh, Naruto, Ninja Turtles and you know other stuff that I enjoy. Before you started doing the art for this one and, and everything, how much of the story did you have written, even if it was just in your head? Um, I actually don't write scripts for Tooth and Nail. I actually draw out everything first. Since everything is in my head already, and I'm the artist, I'm the creator, I'm the, you know, script writer, you know, whether I write a script or not, I'm writing a script in my head. Um, I don't really write anything out. I just go right to the page or I do some, uh, thumbnail sketches from what I know what's going to happen. And then when I go back in, uh, to do the lettering, I already know what's going on. So I just come up. I know the voices of the characters. I know what they're going to say. I know the scenario that's happening at that moment. So I know what to have them say. So, yeah, I actually don't have any script written for Tooth and Nail at all. That lack of a script, is that more annoying for writer Corey or artist Corey? Um, actually, it's not annoying for me at all, especially when it comes to 
the stuff I self create. Um, I really don't like working off scripts. I'll work off a script if I have to, if I'm working with other creators and stuff like that. But since I already know everything that's going to happen in Tooth and Nail, I really don't need a script. I feel like I don't need it. Um, maybe I'll do like a plot summary or something like that before so I can know where it's going. But already as we're talking, I'm already thinking, I already know way ahead of where I'm going. Now, certain things might change as I go along with it, but I try to keep it as consistent as, as, as possible. I go back to other issues if it's something I forgot and say, okay, I got to make sure I fill in that plot, make sure I fill in this plot um, based on my own knowledge of the story, uh, everything. So I don't, I don't really get annoyed with my own way of doing it. Actually, I feel a lot free. And it's funny that I, I actually came up with this idea from um, uh, Ao Miyazaki, I butchered his name, uh, who heads uh, Studio Ghibli. And when he did uh, Spirited Away, I read like um, something that his, his technique of doing that, he didn't write a script for it. He actually just went in and started doing storyboarding. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I could do that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so that's kind of like, that made me feel a little bit less constrained to a script and more of a you know visual storyteller because as comic book artists, we are visual storytellers. We see it visually before we see any um and so that's why i wanted to do to the nail this way because it was going to be a lot easier for me to flow and when i did that you know because at first i tried to do scripts and it was just i was stumbling over it when i stopped doing scripts i flowed like it was nobody's <laughs> like nobody's business <laughs> especially over the past year for me i've finally had it pounded into my head that there isn't really a right way to get the story made as long as it actually gets made and just hearing people's different ways of how they're doing that has been really good for me. Yeah. I mean, it's, everybody has a different technique. Everybody has a different way of conveying the stories they want to do, whether it be movie uh, directors or writers or creators and stuff like that, you know, and you don't have to be stuck to one way of doing things, do it, whatever makes you comfortable. And like you said, it's, it's the best way to get things to get the story told as long as it gets told. And so we have the Kickstarter here. And honestly, most of the time I'm having to ask people, okay, you know, you, you have your collected edition. Why would I buy this when I have everything else? But you said it right up front. You're going back and fixing things up and stuff. Like how much work do you expect that to be slash how much work has it been already to do that? Well, since this is a page by page uh, remaster, it depends. Like earlier issues, definitely a lot more um, fixing up that I had to do. So, um, you know, especially issue one, um, issue two, yeah, issue two, I had to do some pretty much fixing up things. Um, the farther I get into the issues, like right now, I'm finishing up issue five. Um, it's not as much. There are some things that I changed, some things that I fixed, some things I added. Um, but a lot of times I was able to just say, oh, this is pretty good. This is clean. All I do is transfer it over to the new document. Um, and then after this issue six, I think it probably won't have to be hardly touched at all because that's the latest issue I did. Um, I kind of looked over it and I was like, oh, this actually looks really good. I might add a little bit more details, everything. And I actually took in a lot of advice from other people who have read it, you know, people who did read it. I think I went around and I asked uh, different people, including you, uh, what you know, what did you like the best? What did you like least? What things do you think I should change and stuff like that? Um, so I took all of that in consideration when I went back and I fixed a lot of things up. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's it's been a lot of work, but it's been very fulfilling because I get to be, you know, I sometimes I look at myself and I'm like, why did I release it like this? Because <laughs> it was things I didn't notice. It was a lot of things I just did not notice. I'm like, oh my gosh, I put this out like this? You know, a lot of people might not have noticed. So, it was kind of good to go back and, and fix all that stuff up because a lot of people don't like doing it. They don't like to go back to their old work and rework things. They'd rather just move on. But I really wanted to put this out and I wanted to put it out feel a little bit more fresher, even though it's the same story. It is mostly all the same art, um, but it's a different. It's almost like when George Lucas went back and remastered, you know, a lot of Star Wars stuff. A lot of stuff people didn't like. A lot of stuff makes a lot of sense. So that's kind of how I look at it is that I'm going back to this making it a way I would like it to be to it to the point that I can make it without completely redrawing. 
I'm definitely not asking for specifics here, but what are some examples of the types of things that you're going back and changing? Um, I would probably say um, like some of the art was a little off in some spaces. Um, I would probably say like specifically uh, there was a scene where Onyx is swinging his chain around. And now that I have uh, the access to new um, brushes and Procreate, there actually is a chain uh, brush in the program. And I literally hate drawing chains. It's almost like I want to change his whole weapon, <laughs> you know, and everything, because he uses a pulling chain as a weapon. And he's swinging a chain around. It was just not drawn well, because I just didn't, I, I didn't like it. I didn't ha like having to do it. And um, so I, when I went back in, I pretty much erased almost the entire panel, except for Onyx himself, but the chain areas, the way it looked one, I deleted, like I erased all of that and pretty much redrew paint brush that whole scene and made it look a hundred times cleaner um and not as much you know because i tried to do a little background in it while i was going on it just looked messy so now it's a lot cleaner and um i also have brushes for actually uh manga uh or comic book type feet lines and stuff like that before i was drawing in the speed lines which i absolutely hated and uh you know, some spaces they look kind of messy. Some spaces they looked okay. The ones that was messy, I would go in and erase all that. Start using the actual brush uh, that I downloaded on Pro Procreate to make it look, look a thousand times clean. Uh, so those are the biggest changes that I really made, and adding shadows and adding little uh, details. And uh, you know, that's about it. I mean, those those were big things, but though there are things that I felt that was necessary and made the look look a lot better. If you hate drawing chains so much, why'd you give him a chain weapon? <laughs> I knew that question was covered. <laughs> you know what? I asked my question. I asked myself that <laughs> every single day because I was I was going with the you know Ninja Turtle aspect that everybody has a different type of weapon, and I didn't want to completely like do a staff or you know just like you know Ninja Turtles. You already have a character who uses you know, a sword. You have one character that uses two sword, two short swords. And then Destiny doesn't use anything at all except for his power that he has within him. And then Onyx I had to have something that kind of, you know, matches with his character. Where, like, he doesn't like to be up close in battle. He likes to be far away. So the chain is the way for him to attack from a distance. And so that was, like, the best weapon I could think of. Um, I mean, he could have used, you know, a giant star like Sakura. I mean, not Sakura. Uh, uh, Sasuke used in uh, Naruto. But I was like, well, that's too much. You know? So... I came up with the crew of Gossama, uh, which is the stick on chain. And I'm like, now that I have the chain brush, it makes it a lot easier for me to actually do that. I found the panel and it won't. Okay, there we go. I finally did it. <laughs> My scroll wheel was like, here, I'm going to show it to you. You mean the Onyx one? No, the chain problem. What I'm assuming is your chain one. But the way I was scrolling around it, it was like it was scrolling a step behind me. And it took me a little bit to realize it. Oh, and you'll definitely notice the difference in that. That's one thing I'm really excited about, though, is finding the differences in there. Because, like, I mean, like I said before, when you get these collected editions, a lot of times it's like, okay, I just really like the people working on it. So I'm going to support them because I want them to keep making stuff. Or I missed an issue somewhere and it's easier for me to get that than it is to get the single issue. Or there's a really cool add on tier thing that i want to get so i'm really getting the add-on but i'm doing it via getting the collected edition this is the first thing that i personally have backed that like you're going back and redoing stuff and just being able to see the progress in there is something that i'm really excited about because seeing your work here seeing what you've done with patrick over at legacy comics like you make good stuff Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And it's just, it's a whole creative journey for me and, and being able to collaborate with so many other, you know, so, so many people and, you know, really grow as a, as a creator and, you know, just connected with so many different people and getting feedback from the people who help me, you know, get better in what I do. And um, I think that those who actually purchase the original, you know, six, six books, they'll be able to go back and look at those things. Look at the stuff that I changed. And then I'll also have new artwork that'll be in this book that'll like begin each chapter. It'll have you know, a different artwork that nobody's seen before. 
Um, I'll have pinup art from guest artists and everything. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely not not just you know a a you know transfer one thing to another. It's more of I'm literally going to make this a little bit better than it was before. One thing I couldn't help but notice as I look through here and. This is nothing against you at all, I swear. But the original Play Comics logo used a font <laughs> that I then decided was being used everywhere. So I switched it. And you are using the, I think it's Bada Boom font that I switched to. It's such a great font, though, isn't it? Oh, for... For a lot of the sound Yeah, effects. it is. But which, which part? Which one? Um, oh, okay. Like I, yeah, I know you mentioned that before. I know the Ravens Macabre, I think we... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, because what I'm looking at right now, it's the foom right over one of the Rados' heads and the thump. Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I, mean, that, you, I did use that one in uh, 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 Comic Draw. You have a bunch of different font choices in here for things. And how much fun was that, finding the right font for the right situation? That is always fun because, it's, you know what, lettering is part of the creative process. You know, a lot of people might just see it as just putting words on in a book. No, no, you get it's it's a it's a form within itself to make the art. It's like the the dressing on top. You know, um, it's a lot of fun because actually that's easy compared to everything else because I could just go in and I know like what's going on on stage and I'm like, oh okay, this will make it fun. And I've lettered, um, I actually lettered one of the stories in the second Ravens Macabre book. Uh, the first story in that called uh, Cell Block 666. And um, I did the lettering for that. And that was a lot of fun because I was able to kind of play around with what was going on the page. And, uh, you know, even though I didn't write it, I didn't draw it or anything like that, I was able to kind of like put my own lettering chops to um, another, something that I'd never even touched before. Um, when it comes to doing the word bubble stuff, though, that can be a little tricky because if the writer is putting a lot of dialogue on the page, trying to like dance around that without covering up the artwork can be really tricky. Um, most of the time, if I talk to the writer, I'll say, tone it down a little bit with the dialogue, you know, because unless you give me the space, unless the artist gives me enough space to be able to pull a lot of dialogue, that's fine. But if you have little panels and you're trying to say a lot in those little panels, it makes it almost a nightmare for the, for the letter. So it's like you had to really keep those type of things in mind. So it's it's an art within an art within an art. You know, it's it's different levels of art. Another thing that really can be an art that people don't really think about is putting together the Kickstarter campaign. And this one being your first Kickstarter campaign is on the simpler side, which is fine. You know, it, you got to find something that you can keep up with. Right. What was it that went through your mind as you were setting up what to have on the campaign? I had no idea. To be honest, um, I did go to Patrick for ask for ideas. Um, I just, I didn't know. I didn't really know what to do. So I kind of just went along what they asked for um, on the Kickstarter campaign, like artwork and everything. I didn't really know what to do with the different tiers until I really thought about it. So the good thing is, is that you can always go back and you know, change stuff up and add different tiers. You got to start adding stuff before people start making pledges, of course. Um, and I was able to get, I think, four in there um yeah i think it's four i got it there and um you know just making sure that i give good rewards um i didn't know exactly how the rewards thing worked because you, you know you helped me out with that one um and then i know i had to do a video so i had to get my daughter who's really good at tech and editing um do a you know a decent video and everything and um uh, you know we got together and i gave it a, a I pretty much direct to her how i wanted to do the piece and, uh, you know, we made it come together and we put it up there. It took a couple of days for that one to get up there, but I wanted to get um, at least the Kickstarter started before I actually put any other video goals or you know, updates. Or anything. So, yeah, it was tricky. But you also have a smaller goal than what I've been seeing lately, although lately what I've been seeing has been people putting together anthologies. So they're also having to pay like 20 people just for art and writing. Hmm. That being said, you've hit your goal pretty easily. So, how excited are you for that? Um, I'm super excited. I mean, I, I'm really happy that people came along and really uh, supported us because you know it's not easy to 
be an independent person and get my work out there and get people to see. I still, you know, struggle with my sales online. Um, I do really well at conventions. I think that's because people get to see the person. They get to see the art in person. Uh, even though I have tons of art on the website and everything, I don't get a lot of movement there. Um, I probably should do a little bit better with advertising more. Um, but I really advertise the Kickstarter a lot. Like every single day I was putting up something. Um, to kind of push that goal and it, it reached it. And, um, I'm, I, I thank everybody, uh, really thank everybody for that because that means a lot to me. And that means that you believe in what I'm doing. And I think part of it is also is that they've seen my work. They've seen what I can do, that I am a doer. Um, you know, and I want to make sure that people know that, you know, I'm not just trying to, you know, just be a show out or something like that, that I'm like, oh, I got this and this and that, but I don't come through with it. No, I get things done. And a lot of people knew that I got all this stuff done. So, you know, I think part of it was that people were excited of what I was doing, remastering things. I show videos of artwork that I'm remastering. I show people that I'm actually really remastering things. So I think people are excited about that. And it, it pushing it every day, I think people saw that I was doing and people wanted to be part of that, you know, excite. And um, having those different tiers, having original artwork, having you know, the last year you get the you know extra issue of Oni along with it, which is a good companion piece for the uh, the nail series. Um, so it, it's it's it was it was scary at first. To be honest, it was very scary. But as I kept progressing and as I kept getting feedback from friends and everything about what I should do and how I should do it, it gave me more confidence to push for it. And we met our goal. And now we're just you know asking for more support if you can and, you know to help keep pushing forward for future projects and everything um you know that's what we're all about you know just continue to bring out content as much as possible and this is definitely going to help us so thank you so much and i have to ask since this is the manga edition how weird is it going to be for you reading it from left to right <laughs> that's not how it's going to be <laughs> unfortunately it will not be from. Uh, it will not be done that way. Um, I can't do it that way. <laughs> but it's called a manga edition because it will be in manga, uh, the sh smaller book format. Uh, it will read, you know, the the normal, not normal, not, not to say normal. I mean, the English way of reading it. Um, so the reason why it's called manga edition is because I really amped up a lot of the artwork to be more manga, and I actually, uh, you know. Er going to print it out in like the size of a manga. So it'll be like something like Lone Wolf and Cub uh, and Blade of the Immortal. Those read uh, like the, the the English way of reading it, but it's still considered a manga. So it's a manga omnibus type, type uh, format. As we're recording this, we're about a quarter of the way through your campaign and you have it set as a 60 day campaign. So it'll be ending on June 27th. Do you have any ideas or plans to add any stretch goals along the way? Not as of yet. Um, I am trying to figure out what stretch goals would be. Um, at this point, I really haven't figured it out. So it's kind of up in the air. Uh, I have been talking to Patrick, who has been kind of like my oracle to help with these type of things. It's just, I'm so new at it. Uh, but, you know, the stretch goals will, you know, be definitely something I'm going to be considering pushing forward until the uh, campaign. Well, I can't wait to get my hands on this. I know my wife has been wanting to read it, although that's really just a her having too many things to read problem on why she hasn't. But she's heard about it from me, so she almost might as well yeah, have read it already. I know that. <laughs> and I thank you for that. But if people want to hear more from you or keep up with you during this campaign, where else can they find you around the internet? Um, I'm definitely on Facebook all the time. So I'm under, under my own name, Corey Andre Bird, or under Bird's Eye View Comics, um, Tooth and Nail Comic, uh, Bird's Eye View Official, which is my Instagram. Those are my biggest places I'm at. I do do top TikTok videos as well, which shows a lot of the artwork that I'm working on. Um, and then um, I have the same videos that I put on TikTok and everywhere else I put also on YouTube. So those pretty much are all the places you can. And also, you can email me at birdseyeviewcomics at gmail.com. And also the website, birdseyeviewcomics.com. And as always, 
We'll have links to all that down in the show notes because clicking links is so much easier than trying to remember how to spell things. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) I almost forgot. If you could, without any fear of the copyright police, put one Muppet into Tooth and Nail, which Muppet would it be? Uh, Rolf. I would probably put Rolf in there. Play some piano in the background. (laughs) Doing doing action. I don't know where I was expecting you to go with your answer, but it was definitely not there. (laughs) Yeah, I like Rolf a lot. I'm I'm more of a Fozzie person, but Rolf would definitely fit in. If one of the (laughs) cantinas that they might end up in. Well, for anybody who's not convinced to get tooth and nail, I mean, there's your reason right there. You know, you, you have your little bit of craziness that pops up. But then makes sense once you let it sit there for a few seconds. <laughs> yeah, I try to make it make sense the stories. <laughs> well, you know, in the sense of like, what the heck just happened in a good way? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm like, oh my gosh, it's wrong. <laughs> oh man, that would be great. As always, if you want to hear more from me, the best place to do that is to head on over to playcomics.com, where there's links to all the social media things, including Twitter, which is where I'm most active, even though it's kind of a dumpster fire inside of a grease fire. If you want to help support the show, then the best thing to do is to share it with friends, share it with colleagues, share it with random people on the streets, share it with your enemies. I don't care. Leave a review on podcast or Apple Podcasts, someplace like that. Show me that you did it, and I will send you something, because I think that's cool. Or you can be like, oh no, let class Dan McMahon and Carl Antonovitz and gives the show money. You know, making podcasts does cost money, but I'm doing this anyway. So if you want to help offset those costs a little bit, that's always appreciated as well. Don't forget that Play Comics is a part of the GunnaGeek.com network, home to such other wonderful shows as Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., where Laura and Michelle and I are continuing to take a look at X-Men Evolution. We're in season two right now. I have no idea what's going on because I've never seen it before. And this has been a really fun way to go through the series for me. If you like the music that I'm rudely talking on top of right now, head on over to soundcloud.com slash best-day to check out Best Day's music. But most of all, just grab a game, grab a sack of comics, and go find yourself a new favorite character. What is it? Right, it was my first time, so I really... Oh, go ahead. I think you were starting to answer my question anyway. Oh, go ahead and ask. Oh, no.